Scrolling through TikTok can sometimes feel like an empty void. Video after video, endless scrolling. Your brain's turned off. Then you see a one-line hack that's promising to completely change how you code. Programming's being trivialized. Taking away from people who have dedicated their lives to the craft. The expertise of an entire industry just exchanged for virality. Sure, there's convenience and content to feed your fried dopamine receptors, but has the need for convenience and gimmicks replace the fundamental reason that programmers exist. Coding isn't always about quick fixes. It's about problem solving, continuous learning, and the thousand tools that you accumulate that eventually creates the final product that can take something from nothing and build it into something that helps people. So today we're going to put the most viral TikTok hacks to the test and see if they're just clickbait or if they're actually worth your time. So one of the things that people seem to spout as being completely life-changing is these new live share tools that you're getting on a bunch of IDEs, whether it's VS Code's live share or Code With Me by JetBrains, it's basically Google Docs where you and your mate can open the same file at the same time and write words on top of each other. In the example that Microsoft give on their website, these two girls are coding together and to show that they're in different IDEs, they have one in dark mode and one in light mode and wow all the changes that the girl on the left makes it also happens on the right and i feel like if we didn't have this in google docs i think even microsoft words now has live sharing so you you get the little ticker above yeah no they do it's this thing and i think like that experience when you first hear about it it sounds like this incredible life-changing thing but fundamentally is it much different to just screen sharing how far is your co-programming going when you call a co-worker up on teams for some help. Realistically, you're going to share your screen, they're going to say, oh mate, you're missing this, or maybe you have a slightly more lengthy conversation, but I don't think there'd ever be a need for somebody to type it for you, because then they're solving it for you. Realistically, you just want to rub a duck, discuss the problem, and then get on with it, because their time would be better spent writing code, like what you're meant to be doing. So for that, I'm going to drop it in E tier. I can't see me ever using any of these features. The next thing that seems to just blow up for no reason is just debugging in general, but not not the things that you'd be doing typically, stepping through code or whatever, because we've all seen that before. It's it's going into the documentation and finding those things that you use less often. And to be fair, I think a lot of software engineers can go their entire career without really ever reading the documentation that their IDE has for debugging. And really, it's not that much to read. And the payoff is going to be massive because some of these things, like being able to have conditional breakpoints where you're writing in your own logic so that your own, you're not stepping through a for loop a hundred times trying to find that one case. You just have one breakpoint and it hits it. Or, like I said, the watch window. Having, having it in line so that as you're stepping through, you can see the numbers updating and in your mind being aware of, is that doing what I expected it to do? Especially when you get down to things like monolithic architecture where there could be code firing very far away from where you're looking in your current task or just tracking objects. It's nice that you don't have to be flicking back to that class and making sure it still is what you expected it to be, mousing over it, inspecting it. So yeah, if you're going to watch TikToks, maybe scroll through some about debugging and you might see a feature that could be useful to you. But really, is that going to be better than just reading through the documentation? Probably not. Up next, we have Git Hooks, which I found this really underrated video by Git Guardian, who gives a really nice introduction to Git Hooks, because I'm sure a lot of people have worked in an already established workflow by their company and maybe never have to touch things like this. And this is getting into the nitty gritty of automating at the different stages, depending on what the company's needs are. Now, the frustration I've always had with pipeline automations, whether you're in the world of DevOps or Git hooks here, is how much time it takes to automate things that otherwise would take very little time to do. It's a very gratifying experience, and to be fair, depending on what companies you work for. You may go your entire career without touching anything like this just because there's specific people whose job is it is entirely just to deal with CI, continuous integration. But, but if you could get some exposure to this, it would not be a waste of time because even if you come to make your own personal project, as it expands, knowing the automations that are available is going to change your ability to maintain, <laughs> to maintain something as it grows. So for that, it's almost certainly a beta. So coming up next, we have code snippets, which again is something that I feel is so underused. It just speeds up your workflow. And if you have something that you're writing all the time while you're developing software and you can switch it from having to type it out yourself to just pushing a couple of buttons and it appears, automate it because it's just wasted time. You want to be coding at the speed that you think. And one of the ways that you can achieve that 
or get closer to it at least, is code snippets. Here, Visual Studio Code have a nice example here where you're just teaching it, okay, I typically have this template and I enter and I enter code in this order and it will just follow that flow for you. And you give it a keyword name so when you type it into your IDE, it immediately spits it out. And anytime you've written a for loop or an if statement, you've probably used a pre-built snippet. The point is you can make your own. Almost certainly ATA because it's not Vim and you, you, you kind of you're kind of on the middle of the fence of maybe if we're going to put the time into doing this, we should just push the line and we should learn a few other things. Another common theme that you'll come across is the whole concept of being hacked, making sure that you write safe codes. And you'll come across tools like Argon2 and Bcrypt, I think is the other big competitor. And whether you're a front end or a back end dev, you probably need to have at least some visibility on, on hashing data so that we can keep it hidden from people that we don't want seeing it. I've only used it a couple of times, but I mean, worth knowing for when you need it, because it's always going to crop up. Next up, API mockers. When you want to start working on the front end, but the back end is too complex to, to simply override. So you just want something in, something for now, so we can start actually throwing together the GUI with some information that will show up on screen, as it would if we were actually receiving that information from the back end. I think it's very easy to get bogged down with Especially with the speed now that, that you can generate JSONs with something like ChatGPT, this stuff is just invaluable. It just became a game of, a game of copy-pasting and, and fiddling with whatever API mocker that you're using, and it's much quicker than, like I said, mocking up a backend. It's much quicker than creating a temporary backend to fill, or modifying an existing backend if it's complex. Probably CETA, but I mean, if you're a front-end dev, this is probably S2. Right, Docker, if this isn't familiar to you, you need to go do some learning. Just go over to Fireship and watch his 100 second video on, on Docker and you'll realise your need for it. It's the thing that you don't implement at the beginning and then you end up regretting it a year later because it's, <laughs> it's going to be a lot harder to go back and do. It's just another step away from the whole it works on my PC but it doesn't work on yours. Working in standardised environments is just, it's going to make your life so much easier. The last thing you want to be doing as a software engineer is dealing with which plugins are on <laughs> are on what OS and having a bug in your development environment that nobody else on the team has and they can run the master branch fine and you can't. Ata, I think it's something that looks really good on a CV as well. Right, so this might be a symptom of TikTok, but obviously the things that look good get a lot of views. But fundamentally, how code looks is important. If it means that, uh, I don't know, you would have manually gone through after commas and hit the enter button so that something doesn't become too long, then obviously go and install something like this. But I mean, the odds that you've been using Visual Studio Code for longer than a month and you haven't installed this yet, it's just so low. I imagine that everybody's already done this and everybody knows what Prettier is. So for that, we'll just throw it in at C. So next up we have, I don't even know if this is a coding hack, but there's so many videos where it's like, transform your coding, and all the person does is go from light mode to dark mode. And people in the comments are like, wow, this looks so cool. You must be a 10x developer. Does dark mode actually give you any serious advantage as a software engineer? Probably not. I think there's scientific literature that says that using light mode is better, because in terms of eye strain, if the whole screen is dark, and then you just have a small amount that is light, well, your eye focuses on the light bit, so it, so it has to focus on a smaller area, whereas if you have a light screen with dark writing on it, it's the opposite. You have more space for your eyes to lock onto. But, I mean, I haven't really looked into it beyond... I, the only reason that I switch between di dark mode and light mode is based on where I'm coding. When I work remote, sometimes I like to work in the garden or at a cafe where maybe I'm near a window. So if I had dark mode, the glare would just destroy my eyes and I wouldn't be able to see what I'm writing. So I switch to light mode when I'm outside. This is an E tier. I don't care. Pick whatever theme you want. I'm not your dad. Right, so next up, the amount of shorts. Right, next up, I, I don't think we could have got through a video without talking about AI. Everybody in tech absolutely loves to talk about the benefits of ChatGPT. I pay for premium. I use it a lot, not just with software, but in my personal life as well. If you're writing shopping lists, for example, you're mental. Just tell it how many calories you need and how many meals you're cooking for and then ask it to organise the ingredients by aisle, and that will immediately change your life. There are certain things that AI is very, very good at, and certain things that, if you rely on it too much, could probably quite quickly lose your job. But in the same sense, 
with my shopping list idea just there, if it does give you something that is clearly way too little or way too much food, then and you keep doing it, then is it really AI being the problem or is it just you not actually checking its work? I think it's A to don't overly rely on it, but the people not using it aren't going to be able to keep up with the people using it. So for them, <laughs> we'll cut to the Primogen typing at Mac 4. Another thing you'll see a lot of is a bunch of key presses, like what you're seeing at the bottom right here, and then some crazy amount of code changing, and you're just left sat there, if you don't know Vim, wondering what the hell did he do, and what the hell just happened, and how did it happen? Well, I've made some videos on this before, but it's just one of those investments. If your job is to sit there and type code eight hours a day, then it probably would help to get fast at coding, and also just fast at typing. There's so many people that have a keyboard, and they're sat there typing with one finger. What are you doing? This is your full-time job. Like, that should... Vim is almost certainly a beta. It's not required. I mean, the shortcuts that are available in VS Code, what I really miss is the old shift alt or shift option full stop for the Mac users out there. And then you get, like, the multiple carrots that are different colours, and uh, depending on what you select depends on where they appear. There's some really neat stuff that doesn't require you to learn something from the 90s, but yeah, get good at using, at writing code. And that's not to say get good at coding, it's the actual the actual process of writing. Right, so people might turn their nose up at the next one. Uh, DevTools, which you might think, oh, how have you gone your career without knowing what DevTools is? Why does this even need to be mentioned? Well, I'm a desktop developer, and I hadn't used DevTools until, what, two, two years in to my career? And that was because I started working on a side project at home that was JavaScript in the front end. And it, it's, it's an honourable mention. Just the ability to very easily, within the browser, switch between the different products that my clients might be using, whether they're on their iPhone or their Pixel or they're on their MacBook or they're on their whatever Windows laptop doesn't explode within the first year of usage. Yeah, Chrome Developer Tools deserves... <laughs> There's more recognition than I think it gets. I think people just expect it to come standard with every browser, which is fair, but I mean, it's usable and it's nice. Right, so I don't know how many people will know about this one, but um, bookmarklets, which I think I've ever heard anyone talk about on YouTube, and I've seen a couple of TikToks for it, I guess, because it's... I don't even know. I mean, maybe it's novel? But they're basically, in your bookmark tab, you can attach JavaScript code that runs, but Honestly, I, I think these videos were just niche things that were going viral because people that had never seen anything similar before found it crazy. And I'm going to explain why it's not that great with the next two. So yeah, almost certainly an eater. I wouldn't even... I'm not even going to explain it further because I don't think it's worth the time. But just in case you see it, it's just if you're unfortunate enough to be on TikTok and you see it, well, now you know it's not really worth looking into. Right, next, scripting. I'm going to use the Python logo because... This is my scripting language of choice. I did a whole video on automating not only things that you do at work, but also things in your personal life. And God, I think it's just one of those things that keeps your interest in software engineering alive. I, I think you can get bogged down with quite large projects and you can start losing motivation. So if you have, you know, quick wins and one of the quick wins you can have is just, you know, you got to transfer a bunch of files to evidence and tasks that you're working on. So you'd you work with ChatGPT to write up a quick script that manually would have taken you ages to do, but with a scripting language you can do it immediately. I think this is far more versatile than something than bookmarklets because you can interact obviously with your desktop or or a website so you've got a repetitive task that you do frequently. Let's get a script. Just think of all the admin stuff that you have to do and how much of it could I speed up by using a script? Probably a fair amount. So yeah, Python's an S tip. Um, right, so that brings us to the last one, Selenium, which I feel like a lot of people might not have heard of. I mean, you probably work on a team where you have an automation test engineer, and if you've ever looked over their shoulder, you just see the application that you're working on uh, just being clicked through rapidly, and it's clicking all the buttons and trying to break things as fast as possible. Well, I don't think that that work... I, I had the opportunity for about a year to work on the automation tests of a company that I'm with, and... It's given me a really invaluable perspective on regression testing because as a system grows, people stop going to areas that aren't being touched. You know, you might have a feature that, you know, is implemented one month and then it's done, it's set aside, it's still in the application, but nobody's working on it. And 
That doesn't mean that there won't be code changes in other areas that will impact it. No code base is perfect, and one of the ways that you protect against that is you have automation tests that go back there and check that the functionality that you would expect from it still happens. Writing code with the intention of it later being testable through automation requires a certain mindset, and if you can... And if you can just work on this for a little bit, and I mean, one of the ways that you could enter this is the same as the scripting. You could probably automate some of your day-to-day -day admin tasks with Selenium as much as you could with Python. So for that, I'm going to throw it in C tier. It's not life-changing, but maybe give it a look. Right, so that brings us to the end of that video. I hope this has been fairly comprehensive. I only have four slots left on my mentoring, so the link for that will be in the description. When I first started, I mean, having a mentor was completely what set me on the path to performing as well as I do now and a lot of people are out there don't have an opportunity or access to a good mentor so feel free to have a look at my calendar otherwise if you're not looking for hacks and you're actually looking for something a bit more concrete that will guarantee that you get better at software I made this video about how I've navigated learning to be a better coder like this video it doesn't it doesn't mention leak code at all I hope that video helps cheers